We have a guest joining us today who, when he is in Congress, you won't have to haggle over $5 in a snowstorm. (laughs) That's part of his platform. So he is, he is, all right, we'll give you the presidential treatment. You know what that means. Jose Vega's a Bronx-based activist. (laughs) No, I'm not going to do you like that. Jose Vega is a Bronx-based activist who previously worked as a staffer for Diane Sayre who ran as an independent for U.S. Senate against New York Democrat Chuck Schumer. He's recently confronted New York area politicians and Rachel Maddow about their support for the Ukraine war and to demand accountability from the Biden administration for blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline, as we will see. He's currently a candidate for the U.S. House in New York's 15th congressional district against incumbent Richie Torres. Jose! Welcome, my friend. Thank you for having me. I, I hope somebody can explain to me what a gypsy cab is, and then we can mm-hmm. get started with the second. I, do you actually not know a what a gypsy cab is? Term to use anymore. Maybe they don't use that the, anymore. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess you're not allowed. You have to say Romani cab. <laughs> <laughs> no, before Ubers, they were, they were a thing. Well, of course, yeah. That, that's, yeah. A, that's a cab that you don't call. That, yeah, that's the cab know. that just drives around and you hail the cab. Oh, it just it just knows it's just there when you need it. Yeah, well, it's I mean, not a yellow hope. cab like you weren't. It, no, it's never there when you, you need it, but you want it right. to be. Yeah, right. You know, that that's the <laughs> okay. yellow cab that you hail in New York. Before you had Ubers, you had certain private right. car services where if you grew up in Queens like I did, you had the phone number memorized for the local private okay, I'm not car that service. Young. I know about that. <laughs> I do know. About you do that. know about that. I remember that. I know about those. They're like 10 years old calling them for my parents. So I think I I remember those. Right. So a gypsy cab is when you hail one of those as if they were a yellow cab, which technically you're not supposed uh, to do, but sometimes you could do it anyway. All okay. right. So, yeah, yeah. So, Jose, this is really exciting news. Um, we're going to play a little footage um, from your upcoming romantic comedy, When Jose Met Richie. <laughs> um, and this, is, uh, this is you, your first meeting. With Richie yep. Torres, and uh, you can really see the sparks fly here. Cy Hirsch just released the fact that the United States blew up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. You weren't briefed on that. Why not? Are you going to put a congressional probe into that? Yes or no? Because um, this ain't no ordinary journalist. You know that. So. Oh, hold on. I want to hear what he has to say. Nord, Nord, Stream, Nord Stream is a pipeline that transfers oil from Europe, particularly Germany. I'm sorry, from Russia to Germany. So we don't have the authority to investigate pipelines. All right, come on. Now that's bullshit. You know that. Victoria Nuland herself says she's. Does he have your vote yet? You have your vote yet? It, get, it, it, get, it gets better. For anyone who doesn't know, Richie Torres is really one of the biggest douchebags in the Congressional Caucus. And that is a very, very competitive title. Happy that it's a pile of metal underwater. Do you share her sentiment? Here's what we know. The Europeans are conducting an investigation. They investigated. And it is true. Why did Joe Biden say that we are going to get rid of the Nord Stream pipeline? And when asked, but wait a minute, that's run by Gazprom in Germany. How are you going to do it? He said, we'll be able to do it. (laughs) Yeah, we do. It's called Cy Hirsch. Then then produce the evidence. He already produced the evidence. Read the article. Listen, this this is Cy Hirsch. This is the My Lai Massacre. Okay, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He is not going to publish something he can't prove. So unless you're naive enough and you don't know that, I'm here to inform you. I'm at least asking for congressional inquiry into whether or not it's true, because his credibility alone should prompt that, don't you think? We know the United States did this. It seems like you know the answer to the question. Well, what are you going to do? I'm your constituent. I'm your constituent. I want you to actually do something about it. I'm going to try to answer your question once more, and then I'm going to move on. Are That's a non-answer. What are you doing? Because if the United States did this, you are going to you you have to hold them accountable. 
All right. So th- this is part of what's what's been really interesting about these interventions and these confrontations. And you see this almost at every level. People have been so brainwashed into believing that they have no power that that's a radical thing that you're saying there. Hey, I'm your constituent. This is your job to do this. And nobody seems to think this way anymore. Yep. Yeah, no, that's right. I think um, that and, and this intervention was different than all the other ones I've done before, because the other ones were not on people who directly represent me. Although I believe I should be able to go to any congressman with any issue because any sure. congressman, they can their, affect their you. vote. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. But this is the guy that I'm supposedly supposed to reelect if I want to. He's supposed to be listening to me, not the IPAC donors or not whoever tells him. He's, he's supposed to be listening to me. And I'm out right. here telling him, you know, this is what your constituency wants to you to invest. I'm not even saying this is completely like I'm saying investigate it. Can right. you lead an investigation? Right. This is coming from your constituent. And he's he's just so hard headed. And he's also just so vapid. Like he. You'll notice in the beginning he got it wrong. He said uh, Nord Stream is a pipeline that transfers oil. I mean, uh, Germany to Russia. You know, it's it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because one of the things that I caught was that he corrected himself because, okay, yeah, he might be dumb, but not for a congressperson. You know, Jamal would never have figured that out. It would have just been like, uh, yeah, it would have just got, I can't remember now. There was some reporter who, you know, was basically spilling the tea. And that's what he said. He said, you have no idea how stupid these people in Congress actually are. So uh, even the fact that he corrected himself kind of makes him the Moriarty to your homes, I think. <laughs> that's quite a comparison, but okay. Because uh, so- I, don't, I, don't I don't see him that way. He's just, he's really just. Well, I guess we'll see more. I don't need to. He'll show how yeah, bad let, let's is. let's see some more. All right. This is war. This is listen, we are on the verge of a nuclear war right now. I don't think you know that. And the people here don't know that they should. You talk a big game about the Bronx. You talk a big game about a lot of things. But guess what? None of it's going to matter for all dead. Think about that for a second, right? You are leading us into a nuclear war. What's happening in Ukraine directly affects what's happening here. You don't think you're going to get us into a nuclear war? Is exactly how we get into a nuclear war. Now, as your constituent, I demand that you stop funding the Ukrainians. I understand that you're also an Israeli lobby plan. Look, you, how can Head you of the deny curve. what's happening to the Palestinians, but you can defend what's going on in Ukraine? And now you're trying to erase their history. You are you are the biggest fraud. You think George Santos is a liar? You're the biggest fraud here. Boom. Yeah. Ahead of the curve, way before October 7th. Um, so tell people a little bit about that district, because you mentioned he talks about the Bronx. Now you were telling me the other day, I didn't even know this, because this district, I miss being in this district by like a hair. Um, this, you said this is the poorest congressional district, the South Bronx. It is the poorest congressional district in the entire country. I did not know uh, that. There have, been, there have been books written about it. Jonathan Kozal was famous for writing a book, bo- multiple books, uh, on this, on this issue of the poverty in the South Bronx. And he's won many awards and nothing's been done about it. Everyone knows this, you know, I've been around the world at this point now from China, Germany, you know, Ireland and every, I tell people I'm from the Bronx and they're like, oh, OK, yeah, I know what that is. I don't need wow. to say New York City. No. It's like it's a worldwide phenomenon to be from the Bronx and people just kind of like know what that means already. Um, so, yes, this is the poorest congressional district. The poverty line in New York City is about thirty four thousand dollars a year, which and, is absurd. Uh, thirty five. Yeah. Thirty five percent of people living in this district are under that line. And they're all and more people are probably on some kind of welfare assistance. And this isn't counting the fact that there's a lot of squalor, poverty. Uh, This isn't counting the fact that there are like eight people living in two bedroom apartments, right, all crammed in there. 
I mean, it, you know, there are things, there, buildings are literally collapsing in the Bronx. You know, we shut down schools and hospitals and fire stations, right? This place has long been forgotten, but it's not, it's not because it's been forgotten. It's intentionally been destroyed. Um, and this goes back to the history of New York City from 1970, where there was this city planner called Roger Starr who had this inane plan called plan shrinkage. It's like, yeah, we're just going to shut down all the police stations and fire stations in the early 1970s. And, you know, we're just going to see what happens. I wonder what happens. And then it's, it was intended to reduce the population. It's called plan shrinkage. People can, it's all up in the New York times. People can, can Google this. And that's what the, uh, that's, we're still feeling those effects to this day because that's still the policy to this day. It hasn't been reversed. It hasn't been changed. That's what it is. And that's what this district is. Well, haven't they shifted really to gentrification? See, that's what's surprising. The South Bronx, all right, this was a, this was a few years ago now. Some real estate development company did try to do a big gentrification event in the South Bronx that was maybe the most tasteless thing ever conceived by a real estate development company. And that's another very competitive category. They literally had like an urban apocalypse themed event to bring in investors with like barbed wire and and burned out cars, but as like a set and the people in the Bronx came out and protested it. So this is wow. part of why I'm surprised, because I remember reading that story years ago and I figured they had continued to to gentrify the area. But from what you're telling me, no, they, they just didn't for whatever reason, which is amazing because well, you got very wealthy Manhattan just right right next to it. Well, it's kind of like Harlem and also COVID did slow it down a lot, but there are a lot of new buildings being built in the South Bronx right now. Like it is happening, but in Harlem and, you know, you know this from living in Harlem. Um, if you start on the east side, like the most east side of Harlem at 125th Street, it's just right. horrible. It looks. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the walk west. I don't know why that is. West, Do you know why that is? Why is the east side fucked up and the west side's well, nice? Why? I actually I, I, I heard a theory that it's like. um because the, the 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 our rulers, you know, hate the East and only want to love the West. But I think that <laughs> might be a little too, <laughs> you know, like uh, you know. But anyway, yeah. But I I don't exactly know why the East side of Harlem is the way it is and the West side is better. I just know any you know, and this is true for a lot of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King boulevards around the country. They're all just poor. They're all right, just like right. destroyed this way and that is done intentionally that is done as a way to like mock you know the the people living in right, those neighborhoods right. in a way to mock those figures right um all right so let's uh let's look a little bit uh a little bit more at your opponent here so medea benjamin put out uh this tweet torres lies people die richie torres is more focused on backing israel's genocide than supporting his own constituents in the bronx while almost a third of his district, as you just said, is below the poverty line, Torres wants to send billions to keep arming Israel. Shame. So let's uh, take a look at what he's been up to. Why does the European Union's chief of foreign policy say that Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war? Are you disagreeing with them? Are they wrong? Is the EU getting yeah, it wrong? Yeah. The EU is lying. Yeah. You're a disgrace. I'm a disgrace because... Why? Because I don't believe that children should be starved to death. Because I do not siding with a terrorist organization. I am not siding with Hamas. A war that brought senseless suffering to both Israelis and Palestinians. I am not. I am not taking a side with you. I am simply Israel who is carrying out a genocide. There is no ge Israel's like you're absurd. There's no genocide. Over Gen genocide means the destruction of a people. A genocide is the purposeful action to destroy in part or in whole a unique ethnic or religious or national group. Do you not believe that there is an attempt to commit there genocide? Is still genocide. Why then? Why did the International Court of Justice rule there's a plausible genocide going on? Do you at least believe there's a plausible genocide? Do you agree with them on that? There is no genocide. There, there's nothing. Okay. Yes or no? Are they starving to death? And if so, there are people who are starving because Hamas is stealing aid. Uh, Whoa! So, so an organization with a total of thirty thousand people is stealing all the aid necessary for two point two million people. Sorry, an organization of thirty thousand people. Yeah, thirty-five thousand people. Those are members of Hamas. Yeah, yeah. So, but then, why does the European Union's chief of foreign policy say that Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war? Are you disagreeing with them? Are they wrong? Is the EU getting yeah, it wrong? Yeah. The EU is lying. Yeah. 
All right. So this was uh, this was a group that brought a letter to his office. Has over seven hundred thousand people living in his district. He has taken throughout his career over a million dollars from pro-Israel lobby groups. He spends most of his time focusing on harassing college students who speak out for Palestine. He tweets all day and goes on speeches advocating for Israel and refuses to acknowledge the poverty that is going on in his own district. He actually has the poorest district in the country, hands down, out of over 430 districts. 32.1% of the individuals of his constituents in his district are below the poverty line. The national average is 12 percent. So that's more than double the national average. Research conducted by Adam Johnson at The Intercept found that in his public speeches, he mentioned Israel 337 times. He mentioned poverty 142 times. It's clear what Richie Torres prioritizes. It's Israel over his own people, over the poverty and over improving his own district. All right. Anything to say to that, Jose? Um, it, he, well, I, yeah, I'm going to use this moment right now to kind of rally people and their anger around Richie Torres, because some of the best campaigning that's been going on for my campaign has come from Richie Torres. Like, first of all, I just quit my job. I was working part-time as a barista and I stopped because I'm realizing the gravity of the situation and I'm realizing I don't have a choice anymore. I'm all in on this campaign now. Like that is what I'm bringing to all of you, to the viewers of this show, but also to humanity. There is a moral responsibility I have to be at my utmost focus and attention on this campaign. Not even because of me, this is not a vanity thing. This is because this scumbag needs to go, right? And so what I can promise you, what I can absolutely promise you is every inch of me in this fight to take this guy down. Come what may, that is what I am completely committed to. I don't have APAC money. I don't have special interest money. I don't have Lockheed or Raytheon money. What I have is you and your manpower and all of your minds and your moral compasses of people who want to do good. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, this is my first time ever running my own campaign. You know, I'm making mistakes. It's a little sloppy, but I don't have a choice. And that's why I need your help. Because it's exactly because I don't have the IDF behind me or the ADL behind me who have professionals who can just do this for Richie Torres, who are getting ready to bulldoze me. I need all of you to help me start and build a movement here for proof that people like APAC cannot just buy districts because that's what that is. They own over 400 congressmen that, that have received donations from APAC one way or another. And what I need all of us to do is prove that APAC does not have the right to buy a congressional district, that the people of the district have a right to decide who they want in their district, and then it not be owned by these special interests, but by you that you are the one holding your, your representatives accountable and you are the ones deciding who's actually in the seat and who's not in the seat. And so, yes, I'm 25 years old, right? I've never had any actual political experience, but I tell the truth and people know I tell the truth. And that's a way better head start at qualifying me to be in office over Richie Torres and me qualifying over anybody else in the Congress, because most of the congressmen don't tell the truth and they just lie, right? And I promise to tell the truth. And I actually promise to listen to people. But most importantly, I promise to work with you and work with everyone to get this scumbag out. You know, this has been kind of like a, a transformation I've gone through in the last two weeks, ever since, you know, you and I sat down, Russ, uh, uh, to eat, you know, at, at uh, Sylvia's. And uh, I saw this picture of Obama and Al Sharpton, and I was just so disgusted by it. And I realized <laughs> right there, it's like, <laughs> well, that well, that was that was the test, man. I wanted to see if you'd sell out. That's why I brought you there. I wanted to see how you you no, react. So look, now I have no safety net anymore. You know, that barista job was keeping me afloat. Now I got I don't have that anymore. And the, the, the truth is, like, I can't even pay myself on this campaign more than I would I'm paying myself now. You'll see it in the first APC filing. I'm paying myself four hundred dollars a week. That's all I can pay myself. 
because last year I'm one of the people who live underneath the poverty line, right? I only made like $22,000, $23,000 last year. So I legally cannot pay myself more than whatever I made last year, right? So the FEC rules are designed to keep poor people poor if they actually right. want to challenge right. this. Right. So I don't know what comes in November. I don't know what kind of financial situation I'm going to be in. I don't care. Because what matters right now is getting this scum back out and proving that there can be a way for people to win over special interests. And so I need your help. I don't have APAC money. I need manpower. I mean, I don't know how many people are watching right now. If a thousand people came to the Bronx and handed out my literature for a whole day or helped me get signatures, which is actually what I need, right, in order for me to be a choice come November, Right. So if you want to see Richie Torres's name and then my name, I need 10,000 signatures in 10 days. And that window starts April 16th um, and it goes till May 28th. But I want to knock it out of the park in the first all 10 right, days right. to build that momentum. Just to so, explain yeah, this. Sorry, go ahead. Well, just to explain this a little bit to people. OK, so so New York um, has given many gifts to the world amongst them. The American style of corrupt urban machine politics. So Tammany Hall ran New York for about 100 years. Uh, Democrats. It's still basically a one party state with occasional lapses. Um, but because of that, you have these vestiges of Tammany Hall in the system that are designed to make it almost impossible to challenge the Democrats. For example, if you want to change your registration, you have to do it six months. What is it? 90 days. It's 90 days, right? You guys know, Keaton, like that, you yeah. know, well, if, if you want to vote in a primary now, they, they moved it up to Valentine's day, uh, as a compromise. It used to be like something like the September or October before the primary, which would be in like, April, May, or June. Right, it was six year. months. So it used to be like six yeah. months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But now, now it's, it's like now it's like 90 days. Yeah. But still, the purpose of that is to prevent any grassroots candidate from breaking out because they tend to catch fire later because they come into the cycle without money. So they have to spread their campaign on word of mouth, and then they can get some money from donors. They want all of the people who have come engaged or energized by that campaign to not be able to vote in order to not get you anywhere. Now, Jose, we would not honestly, as much as we love Jose, if you were running as a Democrat, that's a deal breaker, man. We don't play the duopoly anymore. Not Republican, not Democrat. He is running as an independent. And that's why we are going to come out. Me and Keaton are coming ourselves to petition people to get him on the ballot uh, was it April 20th? April 20th. Yeah. So 420, man. Let's we'll you know, you know how that's page, gonna man. go. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. gonna hot box the Bronx. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm well, kidding. I don't touch I, the stuff. I don't think Keaton does either, right? You know, no, no. No, no. We're neither do we're I. straight arrows. Yeah. You too? Yeah. Right. No, I don't. I don't. So yeah. we're all there like, you go. <laughs> we'll be the only three out there then. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> we'll be the designated drivers man, I mean, of the event. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, just to show you folks, in case you're not convinced yet, what a piece of it Richie Torres is. Uh, so you might remember this guy. This is uh, Israel's defense minister. And um, he calls the Gazans human animals and calls for cutting off their water and power. This was a few months ago, but just just to remind you. אנחנו מטילים מצור מוחלט על העיר עזה. אין חשמל, אין מזון, אין מים, אין דלק. הכל סגור. אנחנו נלחמים בחיות אדם, ואנחנו נוהגים בהתאם. So, uh, so, what, so what's Richie uh, Torres doing this week? Oh! Oh! There he is. He's uh, smiling and shaking hands with this genocidal maniac. Look, Yoav Galani tweets out, excellent discussion with Richie Torres on developments in the war and regional challenges. We value the United States steadfast support. Congressman Torres reflects our strong ties and true friendship 
as well as the importance of U.S. leadership in the region at this time. Look at this. This is right in the middle of these aid workers being killed. Everybody else, even even um, who, who is it, kid? Chris Coons, who just came out and said they should condition aid. Uh, well, I don't know. I didn't, hadn't heard that he said that, but it's, I know that a lot of people have since come out and said that. Yeah. One of one of the very rank and file Democrats came out, but Biden. Just had a conversation with Netanyahu about conditioning aid, about demanding a ceasefire. Yeah, he's full of shit. But that aside, right in the middle of this, Richie Torres <laughs> literally goes to Israel and meets with a guy who called the Gazans human animals. Now, now, Jose, I think I know the answer to this just from the years of yeah. dealing with the Democratic Party. How does a district that's what, 70 percent BIPOC, that district? 70% oh, more, more, more than that. More. How does yeah. this guy get elected? Because he seems to be the congressman from Tel Aviv. Like he doesn't seem to have any interest in the district that elected him at all. Why would people even vote for this guy? Why? Well, money. Uh, well, first of all, it goes back to what you were talking about with the whole Tammany Hall thing. I was reading a newspaper report from 1975 or 1976 15% of the votes in 1976 in the Bronx, 15% of them were from dead people. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> really? 15% of the total votes still, that came in from New York. Still, they were still time. doing that that late? Yeah. I yeah, mean, back in the day, dead. Tammany Hall dead. was notorious for that. They used to they used to have people they called repeaters, whose job it was to keep changing their hairstyle on the day of the vote yes. and to vote at multiple polls. Oh, good. Okay, so I can probably get like two in then. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, that's why. It's good you didn't do that haircut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, like, so, you know, um, as much as, you know, the Republicans have been crying and screaming about ballot harvesting, there is truth to it. There is truth to the fact that, like, some of this stuff is just straight rigged. And that's why I'm saying it's going to require us moving from just listening to Jimmy Dore or Russell or Keaton and getting in the streets, because if we can overwhelm the machine with like, I, that's why I took this votes. hosting gig to convince people to stop watching Jimmy Dore. <laughs> 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 My work here is finished. <laughs> we can listen to Jimmy Dore. Actually, if Jimmy, if Jimmy came out and petitioned too, that would be funny. I don't know if we can get him to do that, but uh, uh, if he well, did it, even well, for he's coming. Hours. He is doing a fundraiser for you. What on the sixth? On June 6th, of June, 6th, yes. on June 6th. Yeah. So Jimmy, he's almost he's almost got a 666 going there, but he is coming out for 66 to do a fundraiser for Jose. We will, of course, be there. That's a few days before our live show, which Jimmy might may or may not be at. Depends if he can work it out. I think he has to be in Minnesota the day before. Um, but yeah, hey, we I mean, you know, making a joke of it because it's a funny show but you're absolutely right you know what people especially have been burned by the bernie sanders campaign who felt the burn and got burned by it might ask well should i get involved in electoral politics listen man we gotta start somewhere we gotta start to build movements it's not just about one campaign this is part of why i did a segment the other day on the minimum wage increase in california i'm going to do something else about it today I think people on all levels for decades have had a psyop run on them where they don't see themselves as being um, autonomous actors in a democratic society. They see themselves as powerless victims who can't do anything other than bitch on social media about how the elites are ruining their lives. But then when things come up like, hey, Let's give workers more money. They've been so brainwashed and beaten down over so much time. They attack the workers instead of attacking the elites that they supposedly hate who are keeping the workers down. We have got to take back the power from this power structure. And yeah, part of that is running candidates, but not within the duopoly. It's rigged. Honestly, if you were going to pick one that's less rigged, uh, you're better off taking over the Republican Party. I'm not recommending that. Yeah. But if you were going to work in the duopoly, I would sooner work trying to take over the Republicans than the Democrats. The Democrats are gone. 
If, if well, the Republicans know, were as rigged as the Democrats, Jeb Bush would have been the nominee in 2016. Look, I think it's it's uh, it's definitely an interesting year. And I see things bubbling here in the Bronx in a good way. And there are people who, who are working with me that wouldn't have touched me with a 10 foot pole that are now coming out and saying, well, you know, honestly, given the time and the circumstances and, and given also the desperation of the situation, because like we're out here talking about my campaign, but like, let's be realistic here. Right. There's a genocide happening in Gaza every day. Do we actually have till November? We do right. not. Right. We actually do. And like, that's one thing I really want to emphasize with people and like what my campaign is about. You guys had Kynan on your show on due dissidents. Kynan intervened on a panel at Columbia School of Journalism. Second annual intervention. Yo, let me ask you something while yeah. I have you here, because I was curious. Did he do it without you because you're too recognizable now? You can't get in these places anymore. I was going to ask you about that. Can you still do it? I still can do it. Uh, I think I was just, um, I probably had just some prior commitment that I couldn't get out of at that. Oh, no. We, yeah, we got recognized when we went to Sylvia's. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did. Oh, you did, at least. And then I got recognized. No, yeah, no, you know, no. You're right. more you got right. No, no, no. no. Russ, you got, you got recognized. Like, so, yeah, no, I worry but, about it because I want to do stuff like this. And I'm like, are people going to yeah. know who I am? Like, that's the one problem with being on camera like that. If you if you I'm, want to go I'm fuck shit up the, legally speaking within the bounds of the law, it's very difficult to do. I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep this look so that if I ever need to go incognito instead of my normal jacket, I can wear a pullover and I can put a beanie on instead of the the hat, so that people have me branded as one way, but then I show up another way and then it throws them off. But no, That's I mean it. I'm you, gonna you keep need doing that mission event. impossible mask making thing. <laughs> but <laughs> interventions are going to keep happening. They're not going to stop. It's just a matter of like, well, one, I didn't realize how running a campaign is a headache. Okay. And um, uh, I'm glad I, I quit my job to focus more on this because I'm realizing like, yeah, it would have never worked if I was still working part time, you know, but the desperation of the situation, the gravity of it, the fact that people are fed up and tired, it does require me to be completely present attention sure, wise. Sure. You know? And it's not work that I quit. It's also any semblance of a personal life. Like I don't hang out with friends on weekends. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to entertain romantic interests. And Russ knows all about that. And, oh, well, then you know, in that case, I'm not coming. I was really hoping <laughs> to shot with you. But but, now that you mentioned like that. This, We're going to go, this, go this hit the bar. This is my life now. <laughs> <laughs> This is my life, you know, campaigning, petitioning, and getting Richie Torres out of there. Are you saying you're not going to be a good wingman? Well, I mean, that depends, you know, how much do they donate? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay. so for a final, if you're not convinced yet that taking Richie Torres out of office is, uh, is the, you're doing God's work. Um, so Richie Torres decided, um, to celebrate MLK Day uh, in a really interesting way. Um, did he go to a black church in his district, which I'm sure, Jose, you'd know better than I will, but based on the demographics, I'm sure there are dozens and dozens of black churches in his district that he could have gone to. He went to the Central Synagogue at 55th Street and 5th Avenue. Now, I have actually been there because it's it's kind of an architectural treasure, so I went there once. I was curious about it. That is an extremely wealthy Upper East Side congregation. That is who he decided to go spend MLK Day with when he represents this poor BIPOC district. Um, so these are from, I believe this guy is a host on WBAI. He uh, clipped a few pieces from this, Raphael Shumanov. Most speakers on MLK Day will speak about MLK's historic speech. Congressman Richie Torres is too smart to allow APAC to dominate MLK Day so openly, so he made sure to also honor the great man himself. This is what Richie Torres tweeted out about his speech. My MLK sermon at Central Synagogue may be the best speech I have ever given. <laughs> Never lose hope is the ultimate oh message. God. You really can't make this shit up. Um, so, uh, he spoke about the March on Washington for Israel 
a pro-war march headlining a white supremacist. So let's hear a little bit of what he had to say. Speaking at the National Mall in the presence of hundreds of thousands of people, the context was the march for Washington, for, for Israel. <laughs> little Freudian, little Freudian slip there. He almost actually started talking about MLK on MLK Day, and then he caught himself. Right. So he continued to honor MLK by citing him second after Israel and artificially linking MLK with the racist far-right government of Israel that stands against everything King ever stood for. And as I spoke, I took note that the year in which I spoke, 2023, was historic in more ways than one. It marked the 75th anniversary of Israel's rebirth and the 60th anniversary of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, yeah, no, those, those two things totally go together. Then, Congressman of the poorest U.S. BIPOC district addresses a majority white, upper-middle-class to wealthy audience about how MLK's dream speech reminds him of Israel, a wealthy nation that segregates its people, bombs mosques and churches, and imposes ethno-legal restrictions. I have a dream speech. And those words, I have a dream, reminded me that the Jewish people have long had a dream. Yep. That, that's just like MLK's dream. I had a dream that Arab people will drive on different roads and have to pass checkpoints. That was, uh, that was in the original <laughs> draft, right? It was in his mountaintop, yeah. which I think, yeah. Yeah, it's in his memoir, yeah. Um, well, so, so how can I'm, people help well, out, Jose? I think I've, uh, I think I've convinced people that Richie Torres has to go. So what can they do to help? Well, if I could just interject yes, one please, thing can. to drive this home. Okay. Yes. Cause there's something people really need to know about Richie Torres. Richie Torres is a filthy whore of a low life shit for brains demon from hell. <laughs> he really is the lowest of the low. He really is. If there's one person yes. to run against, yes. it's Richie Torres. Richie yes. Torres does not care about Jewish people. Richie Torres does not care about Israel. Richie Torres cares about who pays him. His top campaign contributor in the 2022 midterm cycle was APAC. They contributed $141,000 to his campaign. Overall, pro-Israel interest groups gave him $291,000. And that is, and that alone is why he advocates for the mass slaughter and starvation of men women and children every chance he gets so he is absolutely beneath contempt and uh that's why i'm supporting jose really i mean i love jose but obviously if there's if there's one candidate who needs to go and if there's one district in this country who is equipped to make a statement like that it is the bronx because the people of the bronx are not down with what's happening right now and yes. he is yes and they need to be made aware of that and yes. if they are made aware of that, uh, anything can happen. Is it a long yes. shot? Of course. I'm not here to gaslight in anyone into thinking anything different. Neither is Jose. But this is the shot to take. And this this well, something I almost forgot. Are you finished, Keaton? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> this is something. <laughs> I, hey, man, that's why we call him the cleanup hitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. If there is, it, this is something I almost forgot. So one great thing about having this platform, which, look, we're very happy over at uh, Do Dissidents with the growing audience we have, but this is quadruple our audience. And this is something that's so awesome, and I know Jimmy would fully support this. So Richie Torres is notorious for blocking people on uh, Twitter, on X. But the Supreme Court just ruled that you can't do that. If you're speaking in an official capacity, which he generally does. I've never seen Richie post a tweet about, uh, you know, the, the lemons at the local vegetable stand looked good today. Most of his stuff is rabid Zionist official government kind of stuff that he's dealing with. So I would recommend that everyone watching who hasn't already and isn't already blocked by Richie Torres go join his ex. And uh, as you are legally entitled to do, according to the Supreme Court, I'm not saying to harass Richie Torres, but um, go join his ex 
uh, and let him know um, what you as an American citizen uh, and a voter think about his uh, policies completely within the bounds of the law. Please go join Richie Torres's ex. Don't wait. Do it right now. All right, Jose, what do you want the people to know before you go? All right. Well, if you let me stand on my soapbox here for a second, and if you bear with Absolutely. me, I promise I won't. Be Channel your inner Henry me. Fonda. First, Everywhere there's a guy in the Bronx. One thing is, is that you shouldn't just support me on the basis that I, I'm not Richie Torres. It's, if you don't want Joe Biden and you only want to support someone who's not Joe Biden, then by all means, go vote Donald Trump. Go vote Kennedy. But everyone sucks, right? The thing is, you know, and Keaton probably characterized Richie Torres very well, so I'm not going to repeat what he said. <laughs> what I the man has love, a talent. What I believe what I believe love is and what I believe Martin Luther King Jr. would be actually in favor of is development of that region of a sovereign Palestine. I mean, what is Gaza right now if not just a bunch of rubble and destroyed buildings? What is left of Gaza? And the West Bank is just like this open air prison camp, right? I believe that that needs to be developed into a beautiful oasis, right? I think you can actually make it look like New York City in a matter of five years if world, if the countries got together and say, we're going to actually rebuild a sovereign Palestine. But that's true of Gaza, and that's also true of the Bronx, too. I actually want to see the Bronx be developed. I'm not talking about bringing affordable housing. I'm talking about fixing a lost generation of kids who are graduating high school right now who can't even pass the basic English region state exam, can't pass the math exams, and they're being graduated out. I think something like 40% of people who are 18 to 25 are unemployed, uneducated, and unskilled. We have a program called the Space Civilian Construction Corps where we can build camps that can actually re-educate and reorient youth who have no jobs, who can get on-the-job site training or nursing. Now, that's something I'm adding to the program, where you teach them how to actually build things that their community needs, like hospitals, schools, mm. housing, roads, infrastructure. You give them a skill and you teach them how to be literate and as a way... You bring them up to the standards, why the space component is you bring them to the standards as if any one of those kids who graduate this program can go work on NASA and advanced aeronautic engineering and research. You know, if they wanted to, they could actually build rockets. That's how advanced these programs have to be in order to fix the neighborhoods of our unite of our country and export them out to other states as well so that we can come up to modern standards and then future standards like have them build high speed rail and maglev trains that's my vision for the country i'm not just trying to stop a genocide which i am i'm trying to start development because that's how you actually prevent future wars and conflict if people work together to build stuff not actually fight things that is my concept of love that is my concept of what it means to be in the government and what the role of government should actually be. And when people say, well, where do you stand on Medicare? I think that stuff is just so obvious that anyone should be able to walk into a hospital and not worry about a bill. People should be able to get the care they need. That that stuff is just so self-evident to me that I don't even bother mentioning it. But that's if people right, are interested. Right. That's where I stand on that. Right. I think everyone should have access to Medicare. So what does that mean you need to do? <laughs> April 16th is day one of me being able to get on the ballot, right? April 16th, New York City Board of Elections. You're going to see my team out there. You're going to see Robert Kennedy's team out there. You're going to see Cornell West team out, all trying to get signatures so they can be on the ballot come November. But what our signature gathering process needs to be is not simply about getting me on the ballot, though that is important. And they will try to sabotage on this. I need everyone to be very clear on this, that the opposition is going to try and trick you up. They're going to try and figure out how to throw us off the ballot, right? Because we need a of minimum course. of 3,500 right, signatures. That means we need at least triple that, if not quadruple or five times. But what right. if we got 30,000 signatures? Only 200,000 people actually vote, okay, in this district. What if 50,000 people sign for me? What kind of message does that send that 50,000 people want an alternative to Richie Torres or 100,000 people, right? That's only you can make this possible. 
So I need people to go on my site and I need people to hit the volunteer thing and sign up and leave your number because I will personally call you and add you to the schedule right now because I want to meet the minimum of 10,000 signatures in the first 10 days. And I cannot do that without manpower. So if you are in New York City, New York State, New Jersey, Connecticut, anywhere nearby where you can drive in easily, please do so. If you want to fly in, I will figure out how to get you housing. I That's one of the reasons why I need donations, because I am paying for housing for people who are flying in and donating their time. And I'm paying people a stipend of $20 a day. I'm not going to pay people a salary because frankly, we can't afford a salary right now. And if you're not able to fly out, if you're not able to petition, then you can donate. That's That's the order in which you have to act. Act, be out in the street with me and get the petitions. If you can't do that, then you can donate, right? But I need the manpower. That is what's most important right now because we have to show that we don't need the money to actually start this movement and scare the living crap out of Richie Torres and his rest of his oligarchical buddies and the rest of the IDF who are backing him right now. We need a show of force, of manpower, of people who want to flood this district with my literature and show that... The support that Richie Torres has is flimsy as opposed to the support that we can have, which is showing that we want to reject this suit because Richie Torres is empty. There's nothing there. Okay, it's just the script. He's like an AI bot. He's told what to say and he like knows it because that's what the IDF does. They brainwash their candidates so that they respond. There is no genocide. Hamas right. is a terrorist right. organization. Hasbara. Israel has a right to exist, right? And you so, know? Yeah, exactly. He's so, like a Syrian candidate. So. All right. And for those, vega. Where yeah. do they go? VoteVega.nyc. And then there's two buttons there. Donate and volunteer or sign up to volunteer. Hit the second one first if you can. Because that's what's most important right now. And then if somebody can donate so I can buy clipboards and sheets and pens and just the basics that are overlooked. I mean, I've already seen people donating. And I really appreciate that. And I call all my donors, by the way. You'll be I have a lot of people to call <laughs> actually once we get off here. But votevega.nyc slash donate or just votevega.nyc. You'll see the two buttons there. That is where you donate. That is where you sign up to volunteer. I need both, but frankly, I need you. As a person there, I will call you and I will get your schedule personally. And uh, we don't have much time. April 16th is the first day. I have 11 days. And from now till then, I'm going to be busy just calling people, getting them on the street to get an army of people out in the Bronx and and make this quick and fast because it has to be like that. We have to be quicker than they can sabotage us. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, for those of you, that, for so, those of you who felt the burn. And found out it was actually gonorrhea. This is post duopoly. Now think about what that means. When we were involved in some of us involved in the Bernie campaign, we had to play nice because we were trying to win a democratic primary. It's not that party anymore. We're not playing that game anymore within the bounds of the law. The sky's the limit. We don't care what they say about us on MSNBC. We don't care about that anymore. When I worked security for Bernie, they made me go and have people who had anti-Hillary signs take them down because they didn't want that on the news. We're not playing that game now. So different ball game. And uh, I urge you all to go to votevega.nyc. All right, Jose, man, I will see you when I get back to the big town. Thank you. And I saw somebody ask what my cat's name is. His name is Ozymandias. I'd show him, but he's a sweet one. He's a sweet one. All right. Thank you, man. Hey, there's still tickets available in Stockholm, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, El Paso, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Edmonton, Alberta, Vancouver, British Columbia, Denver, Ashland, Virginia, and Athens, Georgia. See you there. (laughs) 